Devin Sony. I'm the president of Hulk Labs, which is a company focused on the play to earn space. Uh, you know, today I want to talk about a few things. Uh, one, you know, just maybe covering my background, how I got into play to earn and blockchain, uh, that that will be very short. Uh, you know, kind of jumping into a little bit of what Hulk Labs does. And, and finally, really just some, some lessons we've learned from, you know, the past year or so, really diving into the data of, uh, of, of PDE, Game 5, blockchain gaming. Um, you know, as a start, I, like probably like a lot of folks uh, listening in, spent a lot of my childhood, my, some of my most formative memories are, you know, playing video games. But, but even early in my career, uh, my, my first job in college was actually working at an investment bank. Um, helping, uh, you know, companies like Ubisoft and things like that do M&A, buy, buy, buy companies, um, eventually spent a lot of my time in investment banking, um, was, you know, in the early days, um, part of an investment bank called Lazard, which worked with electronic arts and worked with Microsoft on, on sort of their Xbox, you know, kind of launch and some of their acquisitions. So really early in the, in the gaming space from that perspective. Um, eventually joined Goldman Sachs, where I was a part of their investment group, making you know strategic investments into lots of companies in the technology space. And even there, uh, we were one of the earliest investors in a company called Linden Labs, which built Second Life, um, and, which was you know sort of probably one of the first original metaverses out there. Um, you know, had had their their virtual currency, Linden Bucks, had the first probably digital currency millionaire who was you know, flipping real estate in, in Linden Labs. So it's a really, you know, this was back in 2006, 2007, which, which kind of dates me, but, um, you know, it's a really exciting space that I've kind of been, you know, watching and, and participating in for the last, you know, 10 or 15 years. Um, to give you a little background on, you know, kind of Hulk, um, Hulk is a, you know, more than anything else, a subsidiary of a company called Tokens.com. Tokens.com is a publicly traded company um, in the blockchain space that really um, aims to, provide access for, you know, kind of public market investors into all interesting aspects of kind of blockchain and crypto. So you, even for me, who's been kind of in blockchain for the last 10 years or so, you know, buying, you know, NFTs, managing and delegating them, it's, it's not super easy. You know, you have the wallet dash issues, you've always got the MetaMask updates, right? So it's just not fun. Um, and for someone who doesn't spend all day in it, it's really not fun. And, you know, part of the reason we launched tokens.com was to provide a you know a public currency so you, you can go to your you know Robinhood account or E-Trade account and actually buy shares in our company um, that have has several investments in the blockchain space. So you know the three areas that tokens.com works on is one, we own a lot of assets that are kind of proof of stake. So things like Ethereum, Solana, Polkadot, and we run, you know, kind of managed validator nodes to stake these companies. Uh, to give people, you know, kind of access to yield, you know, the upside of the tokens, which you think are, you know, kind of the backbones of a lot of what's happening in play to earn and, and DeFi and a lot of other parts of crypto. Um, the second division we, um, you know, uh, we have is a company called the Metaverse Group, where, you know, we're one of the larger owners of, you know, kind of property in places like Decentraland and Sandbox. Um, but not only that, we develop on those properties and partner with companies like, you know, Forever 21, you know, some large other providers, and we help them kind of actually manage their presence in, in, the, in the metaverse, which we think is going to be a, a growing part of what we do. Um, the third division, which, which I kind of run is called Hulk Labs. And, um, you know, a lot of what we do is, um, you know, really just kind of participate in the metaverse. Um, you know, the one thing that I have kind of fallen in love with, with, you know, kind of crypto and blockchain in general is being, you know, this is kind of strange to say, but a bit of a value investor in the space. And, and for me, the really great thing about, you know, crypto and DeFi and, and even PDE is kind of this aspect of kind of that you've all probably heard with your money Legos, which are you can kind of create, you know, building blocks and financial instruments um, that provide, you know, unique access to various areas. And, and for me, uh, having lived in, you know, kind of gaming for so long, it's a really unique um, way to participate in the overall economy. Um, and, and, you know, you've, you've probably seen a lot of these data and slides before, but just to kind of give you where our thesis started, you know, about six or eight, six or eight months ago is, um, you know, Web3 is really obviously saying I'm merging, you know, my identity with uh, my wallet so that when I do things, um, I can kind of be rewarded for those things. Um, you know, NFTs, which are a, a big part of Web3, um, you really enable people's wallets to kind of own things, right? And, and today owning virtual art, um, you know, are, are a big part of it, but obviously over time, I think that's going to shift to, 
you know, real physical assets that have utility. And I think when we look at, um, you know, kind of gaming, which is something that, you know, hundreds of millions of people do already daily without any kind of financial component or ownership component, um, we have, you know, uh, you know, the first, you know, true physical asset or first true real asset that people can monetize, um, you know, kind of globally using their own identity time in, in a way that there's no barriers, right? So, um, you know, I heard a really neat thing about Bitcoin early in early days, which was, you know, when Bitcoin was really focused on mining, you know, Bitcoin was a way for people to transfer energy from areas that had a really low cost of energy to a place that has a really high cost of energy. So you can take, you can mine um, Bitcoin in, you know, somewhere with a lot of hydro or cheap solar power uh, and use that excess capacity to really create value. And I think, um, you know, play to earn is for, for me and what's most exciting about it is it's a place where you can kind of take this value that people care about in the, in, you know, sort of the Western world and the states where I live and, you know, provide a, a really direct link to that value from places that may have lower incomes, lower opportunities. Um, and, and that's kind of one of the things, the first thing that's excited about us is opening up the possibility for, you know, millions and billions of people to you know, provide value to places uh, that they may not be able to do otherwise. Um, and, and, you know, some of the stats that kind of even today show me how early and crazy early we are in this space is, you know, I think developers are onto something. There's, you know, 1500 plus games that have launched most of them in the last, you know, six, eight months, um, you know, billions of dollars of venture capital that have flowed into these games and these assets and infrastructure. And despite all of that, you know, and despite the fact that, as you can see kind of here, there's, uh, you know, 700 million people. Uh, on the planet that earn less than a dollar a day in, in their normal lives, there's only, you know, 1.2 million active web wallets that, that have, um, you know, kind of play to earn assets. So this just shows me there's a massive gap between, and that's a massive information gap between, um, you know, so I'm going to put air quotes and say smart money or people that are deploying capital and people that, that are seeing, you know, opportunities to actually earn an income. And I think that's going to, you know, hopefully um, we see this just massive explosion uh, which I think we're starting to see the, you know, kind of the early days of. Um, and, and, you know, I think Hulk more than anything else is trying, trying to build a, a bridge between these economies and say, you know, there's developers who are building great games, but need players because heck, there's only a million players out there. Um, there's players that need awareness of the opportunities that exist, um, as well as often access to capital to, to participate in these economies. And then there's investors who, you know, are like, I'm an investor, I'm, I'm frankly lazy, right? I just want to earn money without doing anything, right? So uh, the, the more I can do there, which is, you know, delegate my assets, uh, you know, cut a check and, and, and earn income like that, the better for me. So and I think there's a lot, lots of people like me out there. So what we're really trying to do is kind of build the infrastructure between all of these areas. Um, and, you know, maybe more specifically to cover, you know, kind of what we do. Um, and I'll start sharing my screen here to really um go into you know some of the metrics Just give me a moment all right so you know really what we do uh, at the hulk side is is one really really dive into the data the, the most amazing thing that that you know i found about blockchain gaming is every transaction every play every user is on the blockchain waiting to be analyzed in the same way that people have dived into analyzing everything from, you know, kind of stocks to, you know, inflows and outflows of, of you know, exchange transactions, you can do the same thing to make great decisions on, on gameplay. This just makes you a tremendously better gamer. So instead of, you know, trial and error, you can actually see what, you know, hundreds and thousands of players and millions of plays have done over time and um, make decisions. Um, we share a lot of this data uh, directly on our website at hulklabs.com. That's earning calculator. You can see the link here. But um, what we do is try to make good decisions on finding great games and the best strategies in those games to generate value. Uh, the second thing we do is build tooling and software. Anyone that's actually, you know, tried to play these games, tried to loan, you know, assets, whether it's to a cousin or to a guild, um, just realize how difficult it is, how manual it is. Um, and it, that's, that makes sense, right? It's still early days. People focus on gameplay. People are still kind of getting their bearings. Um, and, but, you know, what we're trying to do is kind of move forward on things like wallet creation, wallet tracking, earnings tracking, so we can actually understand um, how well our team is doing, how well our players are doing, um, and, and how to make better decisions. Um, third, we actually are focused on, you know, building global player networks. 
um, so that we can actually, you know, create awareness of these opportunities um, in, in the broader market to, to hopefully onboard, you know, to help help the world go from, you know, 1 million wallets that use play to earn to 10 million to 100 million. Um, and I'll touch on a little bit more of all these things. Um, but, you know, I think as we go um, onto the calculator side, um, just touching on a few of the things that we really spend a lot of time on. And I think if you go to our site and really dive into some of the calculators, you'll get an idea exactly of what we do. But, um, you know, some of the main things we care about are, um, you know, kind of the tokenomics of the games and the scarcity of the value. Is there, you know, a cap to the NFTs that are being created? How, how are these things being released? Um, you know, more importantly, most importantly, I'd say, are, you know, some of the demand side economics. What, why, why would people actually want to buy the token? Um, you know, some of the soft metrics like community engagement, um, you know, velocity and growth of, of wallets, you know, the quality of the team who's building things that they built real games before. Are they familiar with kind of Web3 and blockchain? Um, and, uh, you know, even just things like accessibility, like how many devices, how many people in the world can actually play this game? Is it, do you need a, you know, a 2022, um, you know, powerful kind of MacBook Pro to run this game? Or can you build it, you know, can you play it on a, a 2013, you know, Android phone? So, um, we're, we're, which most of the world we're kind of using. So, like, these are all kind of things we care about. These are all variables we, we spend a lot of time in, um, at, you know, as we kind of build things out. Um, on the Global Player Network side, you know, a lot of what we're doing is, like, you know, I think everyone knows about places like the Philippines and Venezuela and Indonesia. Those were places that had, you know, almost immediate adoption, play to earn, immediate meeting, you know, sort of late, late last year, early this year. Um, and, and that's kind of really been the place where a lot of that activity has happened. Um, because we, you know, thinking kind of more, you know, from first principles basis, um, you know, when we think about young populations uh, with a lot of idle time and, and, and love gameplay, you know, places like Africa really resonate with us, which is why we actually ended up partnering with the Democratic Republic of Congo, which is a country with 90 million people, lots of them very young, lots of them gamers already, to help them, you know, sort of promote play to earn, um, in their ecosystems using, you know, ideally our training, our assets, um, you know, kind of our, our promotion. And hopefully we'll be onboarding, you know, thousands and thousands of these players this year and hopefully scaling that much more over the next few years. And, you know, we'll, we'll continue to strike these types of partnerships as they make sense for us. Um, we think about the software tooling, you know, I touched on this, but um, anyone that's tried to, you know, administer um, you know, a hundred players on any of these games just has realized how hard it is. It's, you know, kind of manual wall creation, manual tracking, manual sweeping of funds. Like these things just make it not, not very easy and fun to, to kind of play these games. But, you know, we're, we're starting to do some of the most million, menial tasks, automate them in ways that I think, um, will, you know, will, will create a ton of value, um, for our ecosystem. And, and as we open these tools up to the broader ecosystem, um, you know, and we've got an end goal here of saying, um, how do we actually take these assets and um, you know share them with an assets meaning these technology tools, our, our network of players, our data, and then not just use them for our own capital, our own book, meaning our own balance sheet, but open them to other investors that want to say, I think this is a great opportunity. I'd like to participate in you know pick pick my game, you know uh, my DeFi pad, Axie, Provada, you know Deaton Arena, whatever. I think it's a, instead of just buying assets and sitting on them and and hoping them they appreciate value, I can actually leverage a player network to generate revenue and income on, on my holdings while, while the game grows. Um, you know, I, I will kind of spend a bunch of time on our team. We're on our website, but yeah, I think what I will say is we've got a really unique blend of people that have background in gaming, um, in, in data analysis, in, you know, kind of the on, on, you know, kind of technical development. Um, and, and finance. And, and I think it, it's a bit, bit of a trifecta here. Uh, you, you, you know, you can't just be a gamer and expect to understand the DeFi components of games. You can't just be a, a crypto person and understand kind of gaming mechanics and, you know, kind of the mentality of gamers. So we've tried to build this very holistic team that try that kind of jumps in on a lot of these areas. Um, you, you know, with that, um, what I want to do is uh, you know, kind of really jump into, you know, some of the key lessons we've learned, which might be helpful for whether it's gamers, investors, people just, you know, wanting to play games. And, you know, I think at, after evaluating hundreds of games over the past year, I think we found a few things that rhyme with the ones that are most successful, that we care most about, and that we think are going to have the biggest impact on, on the industry. Uh, you know, I don't think any of these are necessarily rocket science, but, you know, as I always say, you know, repetition is, is kind of the best way to 
um, you know, really understand something. And, you know, maybe some of these will be rep repetitive to you, but you'll see some patterns in, in the noise. Um, you, you know, no, number one is, um, I, I think if you, if you build a game that is focused on people that are trying to earn money, you're going to kind of get people that try to earn the most amount of money in the shortest amount of time possible. And then, you know, kind of leave immediately for something that, that pays, you know, a, a nickel or two more. Whereas, um, if you focus on games that are fun, that people want to play, um, you're going to get people playing the games, wh whether they, they make you the highest, you know, ROI or not. Um, you know, the best data point for me is I remember the first video game I probably played uh, on, on a, a Game Boy that looked very much like this one. Um, it, it was Tetris, which, which I think was launched in 1984. You still have, you know, you've got a billion people that played Tetris. You know, you still have millions of people that play today, despite the fact that, it, you know, uh, it's not anything special. It's just a fun game that, you know, kind of gets you in the moment, a great gameplay. Um, easy to pick up. And, and I think more games that focus on those types of things um, are, are going to succeed versus, you know, the ones that, um, you know, offer you 3 million percent ROI on day one and then cr crash on day two. Um, you know, the other part of this, and, and I think a lot of games are understanding this by by creating limitations on, on gaming and, and really tr trying to create utility for their native token. But, um, you know, the demand side economics, like everyone gets that um, the way these games pay out or on, or in the early days is by just creating network inflation, right? It's, it's, uh, what I'd call an ethical Ponzi scheme. You know, you, you need a lot more people coming in on the top to buy, buy these tokens, buy these NFTs, um, in order for the game to propagate, to pay out the yields that they, they're, they're promising. And, you know, the Holy Grail at some point that, that switches and there's utility that's coming out and people are actually, um, you know, generating value. People want the tokens not because they want to make money, but or not because they would need to enter the game because they're new, but because they want to actually unlock things that they care about. And you know, I think when you think about non-PDE games like you know Fortnite and World of Warcraft, they've unlocked a lot of these things organically, and it wasn't easy, and it took a lot of time and a lot of iteration and a lot of mistakes along the way. Um, when you add you know a smart contract component to this and the immutability of the blockchain and how quickly people pile into these things. It's really difficult to get right, but when you do get it right, which is getting someone to really want a token for the token's sake, um, because they can use it for the, they envision using it for the next years, not just the next five minutes. That really creates something special where you know true utility is created, a true demand economy is created, and, and that creates a, a long level of sustainability. Um, you know, this one is always frustrating to me because, like, if you're if you're a gamer uh, and, and you're a, you know. The, the most disheartening thing is to say this game's awesome, but I can't play it until I spend a, you know thousand dollars on a new device or upgrade. And you know this 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 rings true for people who live in the Western world need to buy the newest graphics card. But this is even more valid for you know the, the millions of people um, that want to enter into play to earn gaming who you know might not have the highest incomes, and you know for them a, a phone is you know a three or four month uh, or six month investment. Um, and, you know, all of their income. So, um, you know, y yes, I, I love, you know, 3D graphics as much as the next person. I've got a, you know, PlayStation behind me, uh, PS5 rather, but like, um, instead of focusing on, you know, the, the, the greatest graphics, the greatest gameplay, and even what I call it, you know, low latency, I just spoke, you know, I, I think the games that have the most possibility to succeed over the next, you know, period of time are going to be ones that really are able to tap into people that have, had, you know, Android, you know, I, and Android 4, uh, right. It's, it's, it's a phone that, we, you know, many of us probably had in like 2011 or 2012. Um, that, that's like 50 bucks, um, you know, for us. And, and if, if you, you can play on that game, you can play on anything. Uh, um, and I think that just kind of creates a lot more utility for, you know, the next billion people that we want to onboard into this, this space as a, as a collective. Um, I, you know, we see a lot of, you, you know, you, you look at the fact that I mentioned earlier, there's 1500 games plus games out there, probably another 10,000 in development. Um, you know, a lot of them, you know, kind of rhyme, right? A lot of them are, are card, you know, turn-based card games like Axie or, um, you know, sort of Battle Royale style games. But, you know, I think what we're discovering is the best opportunity here is not going to be to say like, yes, yeah, sure. You can, you can play the lotto and say, I'm going to go build the next Axie and, and try to build the, beat the next 500 games. But there's a lot of niches out there from, you know, desktop tower defense to, to strategy, to, you know, kind of board the game style games to, uh, you know, just kind of puzzles. And, and the more, um, and some people just like certain kinds of games, right? Like some people like Candy Crush and some people like Street Fighter and, and some people like Fortnite. 
Um, and tapping into that existing demand of f- building the great game in that niche um, is, is going to be, you know, a lot more useful for the overall economy than saying, I'm just kind of pile onto the 70, you know, three, you know, the 73rd game that launched this week in, in, in MOBA or whatever. So like for us, like finding these niches um, and, and leveraging them, I think can make a lot of sense. Um, and, you know, with that, uh, I, I thought I would, you know, share some little off at the end, which is, you know, what are the things that we're really looking at playing actively today with our, you know, hundreds of players and where do we want to scale? Um, you, you can kind of see these, you can see the calculators and the ROIs on our site, but, you know, where we're scaling the most right now is the arena. Um, you know, we're, we're closely evaluating Axie's new kind of origin, you know, kind of build. Um, and then, you know, the other ones where I, th- th- none of these are kind of like, you know, you know the, the newest games in the world, but, but we do find them to be, you know, really compelling. And, and the other weird one that we found is that, um, you know, in terms of just kind of not losing all your money and, and, and getting hosed, like the, the best play is almost to say, like, I'm watching a game kind of go up, up on its, um, you know, kind of J curve and, you know, flatten out it, you know, you may have that spiral of death and the, the token may drop 89 percent, but if the game is still great and there's still good players, th- th- that's an often a good time to, to, to come in because there's a lot less volatility, volatility, there's a lot more predictability of, of you know, what your math is going to look like. And for us, that, that, uh, that consistency over a long period of time, uh, can, you know, can make a lot of sense. Um, I'm, I'm going to pause there um, to see if folks have, you know, any questions. Uh, I, I'm happy to kind of dive in with, you know, kind of comments, questions, uh, discuss anything that people would like to talk about, about what we do at Hulk, you know, what we're seeing in the industry. Uh, you're, you guys are also welcome to come find us at Hulk Labs, our, our Twitter, our Discord. But, but beyond that, I'll, I'll just take a minute to, to pause on my end for, for questions. And if there's not, we can, we can just kind of, and great. Well, you know, I'll, I'll leave it there for now. Um, and thank you everyone for, for jumping in. And, uh, if you do have questions, feel free to, you know, reach us at, at Hulk labs uh, on any of our socials on our website. And we'd love to discuss, you know, if you're a game and want to partner, we'd love to kind of discuss that as well. So, uh, thanks everyone for coming.